Welcome everyone. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first ever Meet the Author virtual event. My name is Brian Schmidt. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University and we are very privileged to be hosting the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull and Catherine Murphy. Now, for those of you who are regular attendees of ANU events, you will know that we often utilize Llewellyn Hall for our bigger events. And while we can't host you on our campus tonight, it is wonderful that we are able to bring to you this event virtually from Llewellyn Hall. I'm joining you from my home on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people, and our large audience tonight joins us from many different parts of Australia. Tonight, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we, each of us meet, and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. Before we start this evening, I'm gonna run through a few pieces of quick housekeeping. This event will include a Q&A component later this evening, so please submit your questions throughout the event by clicking Q&A. You will have received an email from our events team with step-by-step -step details on how to do this. Please include your name and city along with a brief question. Now, due to the large size of the audience, we won't be unmuting microphones or using chat for your questions, so please submit them via the Q&A button and try to avoid using the raising hand function if you can. If you do have any questions or experience any technical difficulties, please contact events at anu.edu.au. I'm now delighted to welcome former Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, to chat about his new book, A Bigger Picture. Congratulations, Malcolm, this week. It has been hard to miss the extensive coverage of your autobi autobiography, and it's clear you have more stories than can fit into one book, even if it is more than 600 pages long. Now, the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull served as the 29th Prime Minister of Australia from 2015 to 2018. And during his time as Prime Minister, we saw the fierce debate of marriage equality across the nation and eventual public affirmation of same-sex marriage. He was responsible for the establishment of Snowy Hydro 2.0, an important step in creating sustainable and reliable renewable energy. He also stood up to Donald Trump very memorably and rebooted Australia's defense industry, among many more achievements. Malcolm grew up in Sydney, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws from the University of Sydney. He was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship that allowed him to complete a Bachelor of Civil Law with honors from the University of Oxford. Malcolm spent his pre-politics life working in many different professions, including as a journalist, a lawyer, merchant banker, and venture capitalist, and bringing such diverse life experiences to be unpacked. This book gives the Australian people such a rare access to the inner workings of Australia's political system, something that fascinates many, including myself, as an American. I think your insights during your time as Prime Minister provide a particularly valuable and unique perspective as you discuss events many of us has experienced, yet you do so through a lens that we would otherwise not get to view. Beyond politics, though, your book tells stories from your childhood and, importantly, the highs and lows of business and of life in general. I'm looking forward to reading your book, as I'm sure many of the audience are. I'd also like to induce, introduce our host for this evening, Catherine Murphy. Catherine has been Guardian Australia's political editor since 2016, working in Canberra's parliamentary press gallery for 22 years. Catherine is adjunct associate professor of journalism at the University of Canberra, from which she was awarded an honorary doctorate in October 2019. Catherine has won the Paul Lynham Award for Excellence in Press Gallery Journalism and has been a Walkley finalist twice. Lastly, I'd like to thank Emeritus Fellow, Mr. Colin Steele, who has established our fantastic Meet the Author program, which has captivated our community for over 30 years now. Very pleased Colin is with us here tonight, and I thank you for your continued work to make the Meet the Author series possible and bring such a high caliber of authors to ANU. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Catherine to host the In Conversation. And so without further ado, I would like to invite Catherine to start. And thank you, Catherine. Thank you one and all. Thanks to Brian for such a generous introduction for both Malcolm and myself. And uh, I join with him in paying my respects to the traditional owners uh, on the lands on which we meet, and also in uh, paying my respects to ANU 
uh, to Colin and to others who, as Brian says, runs an absolutely superb Meet the Author series uh, that I've been part of several times in the past. So I'm delighted this evening to be speaking to Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull. I covered Malcolm's prime ministership, obviously, uh, all the highs and lows of it. Uh, and I have read the book uh, and it's a terrific read. And I want to start, Malcolm, uh, with an observation that is also a question, if I can. So uh, the book opens with this great brio and ebullience. There's a uh, young Malcolm racing around the eastern suburbs of Sydney. There's your school adventures, there's university adventures, your precociousness in doing several things all at once. Uh, you head to Oxford uh, among uh, many, many japes there. You uh, demand that the vicar marry you and Lucy. Uh, then we sort of sprint into the business career again, uh, where there's great sort of energy and ebullience. But then the creeper we, or the, the closer we creep to your political life, a pall begins to descend. Uh, I, I felt the gear change very strongly, actually reading the book from uh, early life to public life. So I just want to start with a general observation. So obviously you did, you did come across from business, from journalism, from the law to, uh, to politics. Uh, setting aside traumas, which I'm sure we'll get to, what, what are your observations about being a politician uh, in this period of history? What is it actually like to run a government right now? Uh, listen, before I begin, given that we are at least virtually in Canberra, can I say, Yangu Galinyi Nalawi, Dani Nanawaldara, Wangara Lijinyin, Marani Balan Bagarabang. Now, that's an acknowledgement of country in the Nanawal language. And uh, I was the first Prime Minister, I think, the I may have been the first member of the House to speak in the Ngunnawal language in the House of Representatives. Uh, it's a very interesting story how the Ngunnawal language group and the Canberra district has been rediscovering and uh, uh, the language, um, which was not entirely lost. And they've had fantastic support from a great institution in Canberra, AATSIS. So, with that said, let me get, get on to the answer to your question. Look, uh, being Prime Minister of Australia is the best possible job. There is never a bad day to be Prime Minister. You can have bad days in the sense of terrible things happening, uh, but it's always a great honour and a great opportunity. So, uh, but it is, look, it, it's, it's, you know, it's the office of wicked problems as Annabelle Crabb described the Prime Minister's office, because if the problems were easy to solve, they probably wouldn't find their way to the PM's desk. So uh, it's, and these are particularly challenging times at the moment, but as you, as you know, and people will read in my book, we had plenty of uh, interesting challenges, uh, personal, party, ideological, international. Um, no one was expecting, you know, the parliament to be progressively cleaned out by section 44. Mm. Uh, and um, nobody was expecting Donald Trump either. So it's a lot of exciting, challenges and that's 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 what makes the job so uh such a great job to have it makes it very interesting okay well let's start with leadership and uh and leading a political party now uh you uh you had two periods of leadership uh one yep. in opposition one in government now i saw you try and learn some lessons from your first period as as uh, opposition leader and project them into your prime ministership but this is your show, Malcolm. So what did you learn the, from your first period of leading the Liberal Party? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I, I learned that the Liberal Party, that there is a group of, there is a group or a tendency or, a, you know, an element in the Liberal Party that have always uh, opposed me. They are, that's, this is the sort of the, the right wing. You know, it's the Liberal Party is a broad church uh, but I've, you know, I've, I've had some pretty trenchant critics on the right, as you know, for pretty much all my political career. So that managing that is, uh, was always going to be challenging. I learned, uh, from the experience with the emissions trading scheme policy in 2009, that when we were, when we came back to energy, I should do everything I could to keep the party together, keep the cabinet together, be 
consultative, painfully so, you know, make sure that nobody felt they hadn't been brought into the tent or consulted. And I did all of that, and that's why the National Energy Guarantee had such <clears throat> overwhelming support, but it was still not enough because there was a minority that was determined to bring the government down and bring my leadership down, uh, you know, in, in part because they wanted to frustrate Australia taking effective action on climate change. But then so that's the that that's the sort of that is the that's the fundamental problem. Uh, as I said to you on the day I uh, I resigned, uh, you asked me that question in the Prime Minister's courtyard, and I said to you, you know, the coalition has a fundamental problem dealing with climate change, and it's because of that of that group who basically hold the coalition hostage. But uh, you did, uh, I, I concur with that, you did, uh, that, that's precisely the lesson you learned and you took into your prime ministership was yeah. to yeah. be more consultative, to, uh, to try yeah. to bring together yeah. the various camps in your political party. Uh, I mean, that is, that is the story of your prime ministership on so many fronts. Uh, but they uh, they saw you off anyway. So, so uh, the question really is about learning. I, uh, you you well, are a pain. Well, I, I, I haven't learned what the question is yet. Well, <laughs> be patient, Malcolm. I am listening. Be patient. Uh, so uh, you you learn. Be more consultative. Be more collaborative. Yeah. You project that into your prime ministership. Yet in the end, they dispatch you anyway. So. Uh, so did you did you not learn the right lessons? Were they again you from the start? Uh, reflecting on that, does uh, does it feel like I suppose the the learning from round one was a waste of energy? Well, no, not at all, because we got a lot of other things done as well. Uh, the you know if there is a group of people in a parliamentary party like the Liberal Party that are prepared to blow the government up to get what they want in the expectation that the government will lose office, which is what they did. Uh, it is, it's, you know, it's very hard. It's like being on a ship with, uh, you know, members of the crew wanting to let off an explosion against the hull below the waterline. You know, people are prepared to do that. You've got a fundamental problem. And uh, so you're right, I did everything, I did everything right in terms of consultation, uh, but it wasn't enough and they were determined to, uh, to see me off and created enough mayhem with their friends outside the parliament, particularly in the media, uh, to do so. Of course, they didn't get their candidate up. You know, their goal was to make Peter Dutton prime minister, but in the chaos that followed, they got Morrison, who of course was the person they least wanted to be prime mm. minister. Mm. So they, were, um, they, were, they got full marks for destruction, but uh, very low marks for, um, effectively achieving their goal. Achieving the end point. Uh, during that mad week uh, where uh, you were blasted out of the Prime Ministership, Warren Ench uh, wrote on the petition uh, that uh, he was signing the petition to spill your leadership. And that, this was for Brendan Nelson, he yeah. wrote. Now, uh, that was a bit of self-serving, <laughs> that was a self-serving fig leaf to cover up the reality that Warren was doing it because he was under pressure from the LNP. Well, well, the LNP basically put out a, you know, a, what do they call it? A three line whip in the House of Commons, but they, the pressure on the Queensland members was inexorable uh, and irresistible for almost all of them yeah. uh, to uh, support Dutton. No, sure. And that, that's certainly true. They did, they did whip their own numbers uh, behind mm. Dutton, but the, but the, my point was a, a larger one. Um, obviously uh, the, 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 that mad leadership week was without a doubt the maddest, the maddest seven days I've ever seen in politics and I've seen a number of mad days. But uh, why is it, uh, the events beg the, beg the question, beg Warren's question. Uh, obviously you took uh, the party leadership uh, from Brenda Nelson. Uh, you also replaced Tony Abbott in the leadership. Uh, on, on two occasions, uh, on two occasions, you lost the leadership uh, of, of the party. So why is it okay for you to take the leadership of the party, but not okay to lose it? 
Well, in 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 the case of, I mean, each leadership uh, contest is has got to be looked at on in, on, on its own facts, right? Uh, Nelson was um, in a terrible, you know, situation. You know, as you know, electorally from the polling point of view, uh, I didn't challenge him. I mean, Nelson, I wasn't sort of setting out to challenge Nelson. I've been overseas for. 10 days or so with Lucy in, in Venice, actually. Um, and I got back jet lagged one morning and uh, at about uh, six o'clock that night, <clears throat> Nelson announced that um, he was spilling the leadership of the party and there'd be a ballot the following morning. So I was completely ambushed. And uh, that was the intention. You know, Joe Gash, you remember, who'd been overseas at the UN, she'd been brought back so that she could vote for Brendan. So the idea was to flush me out and defeat me in the ballot. And of course, as it turned out, I, I won the ballot. Uh, but, you know, Brendan, you know, Brendan's position was terrible from, a, you know, polling and every other point of view. As far as Abbott was concerned, uh, I thought he was leading a terrible government. I felt ashamed being part of it. It was, it was I either had to challenge him you know, my intention was to challenge him, and if I was unsuccessful, as I told him, resign. I'd be, I'd be gone. Uh, so I did so, and uh, it, with the electoral reaction, was extremely positive, as you know. Uh, in terms of the challenge against me, what was the basis of it? There was, you know, we were, from an electoral point of view, we were in the strongest position we'd been in since the 2016 election. I mean, the view that many of us held including Scott and including many others, some of them are quoted in the book, was that uh, the right were not concerned that I would lose the election, but rather that I'd win it. In other words, they'd rather they had shortened as PM than me. Uh, let's, uh, I'm just conscious time short, and I'm just reminding everybody tuned in to uh, send your questions. And not, via and that. not everyone is as fascinated with the coup as perhaps you are. So. Oh, no, 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 I'm still, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as, as fascinated. Morbid fascination. Morbid, morbid. Um, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a dreadful, it was a dreadful week. Um, uh, so uh, now we, the media, we copper pasting in the memoir. Uh, and I want to, there's two. Well, you, the Guardian, you're about no, no, no. Part of the media, I say <laughs> nice things about. <laughs> no, no, the media you and the generally. ABC. <laughs> the media generally, right? There's oh, yes. uh, significant issues here. So let's look at both of them. You uh, critique uh, the right wing media ecosystem in Australia, Murdoch, Sky, and others, and we can get on to that and moguls in a moment. But the rest of us also do cop a pasting that uh, has been too interested in soap opera uh, and mm. not uh, not sufficiently interested in policy is that is that your impression and and if if it is well, i think it's true i think you know it's right too i mean <clears throat> you know you and uh lenore's no longer in the gallery but lenore taylor used to write very well about policy always and you always have too but um the press gallery you know look <clears throat> there are plenty of honorable exceptions but i think we know now that politics is covered largely like a, like sport, like football, you know, and it is, uh, you know, who's ahead, who's up, who's down, you know, who's sidestepped whom, who's tackled whom, and that's the that is the so it's the game that's being covered, uh, not the actual substance of the issues. Now I'm not saying the game is unimportant, but you've got to be prepared to cover some of the the issues as well and. Uh, I don't think governments are being held to account sufficiently. Uh, and I don't think the, you know, I think one of the problems we've got is that lying and dissembling is rewarded uh, as clever politics rather than being called out. And of course, the Medi scare in 2016 was a classic case of that. Just with um, moguls, let's think about that for a minute. <clears throat> you, you recount a number of conversations in the book, Kerry Stokes, Rupert Murdoch, other players. Now, in, Packer, in, in the, Packer <laughs> all, yeah. all of them, right? But moguls, various, I've had a few. Well, exactly, right? But, but there's also, uh, that has been a long established tradition in Australia's political system, dating back from Alfred, to Alfred Deakin and David Syme, that there has mm. been this close... Uh, 
a symbiosis, if you will, between uh, media proprietors and politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, but you narrate some uh, some some um, very contemporary uh, or well, a very contemporary experience of that. So, do you think that that's always been crook that that uh, that uh, politics and and media moguls are are too close that there is this symbiosis that can send the whole thing well cancerous for want of a better word or do you think that that things have have gone off the rail, run off the rails in more contemporary times than say back when Alfred Deakin was speaking to David Sign? Well, I've been involved in. Um political politics and journalism and moguls for well over 40 years. Um, and uh, have worked with a number of them, worked against a number of them, sometimes the same person. So I'm, you know, I'm familiar with the scene. I think it's worse than it's ever been. I think what has happened is that the, the for a start, the domination that Murdoch has in the print media is, is a is a, has been a big problem for quite a while. Of course, it was a Labor government that allowed him to acquire the Herald and Weekly Times back in the late 80s. Um, but the, the reality is that media has become so partisan. You know, there, there isn't even, if you look at, take a newspaper like The Australian or take, you know, Sky News for, you know, just two examples. There is not even the pretense of objectivity. This is political propaganda. This is a political organisation that employs journalists to do their work. And, you know, even to absurd lengths. Uh, and, and like a political, pro you know, propaganda uh, medium, they defend their friends, they don't hold their friends to account, they attack their friends' enemies. Um, you know, they, it's a, it is a, it's a shocking state of affairs, and it is much worse now than it has been, as it has become in the United States. I mean, you look at Fox News's relationship with the White House, it's like it's the relationship is like a, that of a state-owned broadcaster with an authoritarian regime, except in, that, in, this, in the States, maybe the ownership flows the other way or the control and influence flows the other way. But it is, it is, a, real, it is a real problem. So the... Uh, you know, what you're seeing are very few opportunities for people to get a really, you know, a straight account of news. Uh, and you get this idea of alternative facts and bizarre spin. I mean, you know, just little sort of th kind of absurd things. I mean, the, um, the News Corp, you know, as you know, I was on the 7.30 report on Monday night. It was the with Lee Sales and no doubt thanks to Lee's, uh, you know, talents uh, and star quality, the ratings for the 7.30 report was the highest they've had since 2015. So it was a huge success from the ABC's point of view. If you have a reader of the News Corp papers, you'd believe the program was a flop. And they literally wrote it up as being a failure because there was one program that night in that slot that outrated it. You know, so it's it's literally, so it is every it, it's a it, it's a dangerous time now. Why has this happened? Let me give you a theory. In the old days, before pay TV, uh, before the internet, uh, media and newspapers, for example, had to wanted to appeal to a broad audience because they wanted to maximise the eyeballs that they got for their advertising. And so when the Sydney Morning Herald was founded in 1840 or thereabouts, it said on its first page, in moderation placing all my glory while Tories called me Whig and Whigs are Tory. Now the old Fairfaxes were very much in the Tory side of the political divide, but they knew they had to get as many readers as possible. Nowadays, the economics of media have completely changed. And so people can narrow cast it's cheaper to produce news, particularly electronically. You can narrow cast to a very, you know, narrow silo uh, of the community, and you can do quite well out of that. And so essentially people are now able to select their own facts and their own news. And instead of us getting the same set of facts, more or less, and the same, uh, you know, factual fact-based reporting, we're now getting 
basically being told what we want to hear and it's becoming increasingly opinionated and partisan. And so you get what used to be news organisations turning into politic effectively political organisations that uh, purport to be um, media organisations. Now, you know, I give, I, you know, I think the ABC strives very hard and as indeed do so do the Fairfax newspapers to keep the balance right. The Guardian does a very uh, good job too, although the Guardian is a avowedly smaller liberal, you know, I suppose left of centre you know, newspaper, but you're not seeking to misrepresent the facts. But elsewhere in the media landscape, it's getting more and more, um, you know, it's getting, it's getting more and more dangerous because uh, you're essentially dividing the community and, and not, they're not having the shared facts that you, you need to have to make a share, the shared decisions that we should be making in a democracy. Mm, well, it, sort of, it, it kind of loops back to the question I opened with about what it's like to govern uh, well, in it's, this it's, contemporary I mean, it's, environment. It's, it's, it's hard, but I mean, having said that, you know, as I've said many times before, quoting, I can't recall whether it's Churchill or Enoch Powell, two very different people, but one or other of them said a politician who complains about the newspapers is like a sailor who complains about the sea. But, but equally, uh, it's not really complaining about them. It's just pointing out, calling, them, calling it out for what it is. Mm. Um, I want to uh, ask you too, um, uh, because I don't think you've covered it in, in uh, a number of your interviews, book interviews so far, there's some uh, fantastic stories about your interactions with world leaders. Brian kind of flagged that in the introduction. Uh, some <laughs> quite fabulous stories, uh, including uh, uh, the uh, the encounter you had in the skiff uh, with uh, is it, is skiff. Is that is that the acronym? Word, yeah. uh, but, yes, I thought that, Donald yeah. was referring to a sailing boat. Initially. Well, yes, That's yes, it was quite extraordinary. That look, make sure you read that in great detail, everybody who's uh, who's listening on. It's quite it's it leaves quite an impression in your mind. Mm. But uh, but look, yours in, in that sense of uh, of uh, drawing out um, uh, character studies of your contemporaries uh, overseas, uh, you know, is you, it's the most rollicking kind of political memoir certainly since Bob Carr's, which also told a lot of stories about his uh, involvement or, or um, interactions with uh, with his foreign ministers overseas. So. You've been very candid, so let's be candid. Uh, did you have favourites? Did you did you have people whom you regarded as friends amongst uh, your leader cohort around the world? And uh, conversely, uh, who was who was the most terrifying? I think I can I think I can guess the answer, but who who was the most terrifying? Uh, well, uh, I'd say let's let's start off with terrifying. I think the most Terrifying is not the right word, but uh, a, a leader that left a very distinct impression on me was Vladimir Putin. He is a very, he's got a cool deadliness around about him that is uh, a sort of a, uh, a genial menace uh, that is, uh, that's quite <laughs> can, distinct. Can, can you be a genial menace? <laughs> I, I know what you, you mean. Smart, well, <laughs> The first, I'll tell you the story. When I first met him, it was 2007, and I was Howard's environment minister. And it was during the APEC in Sydney, and Putin was president, and he was there for APEC. And we had a meeting with some of his ministers, and John had some of his. And uh, as he was introducing us, he said, he said, oh, uh, Mr. President, this is Mr. Turnbull. He's the environment minister. And, you know, he spent some time in Siberia. And Putin, this thin smile just came across his face and he leant forward like this and he said, really, what crimes did you commit? <laughs> and nobody knew whether to laugh or not. No, no. Well, but it was very, it was yeah. very good. Mm. Um, I get, anyway, um, look, in terms of unpredictability, obviously Trump, I mean, Trump's, Trump's MO is to be unpredictable, you know, and he boasts about that. That's his... You know, he is unpredictable and he is idiosyncratic. Uh, he is, you know, one of a kind, all of those things. So I think that's, you know, the, the assumption about Trump was that he would become institutionalised by the American system when he became president. Uh, but he did not. 
and he's you know he is very much the same you know larger than life new york real estate billionaire reality tv show host personality that he was when he was elected mm. but yeah. I, in terms of we talked about friends well yeah, look friends. i mean you know uh, you know john key is a remains a very good friend uh joko Widodo, president of indonesia is a very good friend uh lee sien lung uh is a good friend and their wives and you know lucy i mean you know that's sort of the the lucy and i are friends with all of those people and their partners you know so it's uh, that's you know they're examples um i stay in touch with the uh regularly with um emmanuel macron um not so often with uh, the prime minister edward philippe who is who is a phenomenal phenomenally impressive person as well france is very lucky um so yeah i mean it's not a, it's not a complete um it's not you're not you're not entirely cast into the wilderness when you lose office. <laughs> um, we've got we've got a stack of questions lining up, which I will get to in a sec, folks. I promise. Uh, just a couple of things because I'm curious. I wanted to uh, just engage you. You've spoken a lot about this in interviews uh, for the memoir, but you write very compellingly about shame, regret, trauma, mm -hmm. remorse. Uh, falling into depression, uh, you know, Bob Hawke was very candid emotionally during his prime ministership. It was kind of all out there. Uh, did you feel during your prime ministership that in, in terms of the emotional ride of it, that, that you couldn't be all out there? You've told the story after, after being in office, not during it. Well, I think a, a bit of circumspection was probably required. Uh, you know, so you have to, in that line of work, fake it till you make it, to be honest. Yes, so, so, uh, so. Uh, but by the way, Catherine, can I just ask you this? Can you see me all right and hear me okay? Yeah, all good. Good, look, my, I'm having a computer problem here, but it's all right. As long as you, I can't see you, but as long as you can see me uh, and everyone else can, that's good. Okay. Um, I, um, yeah, I might uh, just turn that, okay. Yes, the, 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 so I think I was, I think, you know, you've, it's a question of judgment of how much of your heart you want to wear on your sleeve when you're in public office. And uh, I don't think someone said to me, you know, did you think of cons consulting your colleagues about your uh, depression at the time? And I said, as you know very well, if I'd done that, the press gallery would have found out about it within minutes. So. Mm. Mm, yes, yeah, dangerous. And also just on, on a, current, a couple of current issues, just because I'm quite curious, uh, COVID, obviously, it's a major crisis, uh, wicked problem. Uh, does it make you want to be back? And uh, if you were back, how would you be dealing with it? Uh, would, would it be similarly to Scott Morrison? Would it be different? Is the stimulus too big, for example? Oh, look, I, 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 I think it would... The reality is it's too early to say as to the second part of the question whether the stimulus is too big. Um, it's certainly, um, what would I say? It, look, I think the, I think that, let me just see if I can, uh, hang on, I'm just going to try and fix something here. Uh, one second. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of a, Yeah. I'm just having a, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll just have to put up with it. Um, the um, look, it, it's, it's too early to say whether the stimulus is too big, but I, I think it's, I, I suspect it may find it may turn out to be, you know, about somewhere between about right and inadequate, and have to be topped up. I think the government's made uh, the decisions that it's made uh, have been good. Uh, the policy responses have been very similar to those in other comparable countries. So, you know, there's, it, so that gives you an indication that if, at least if we're getting it wrong, everyone's getting it wrong at the same time. Uh, I, I think the response of the federal government and the states and territories have been good. It's good the way they've worked together. Uh, these are unprecedented times. There's no rule book for this. So they've just got to, they've got to, uh, do everything they can to keep people engaged with the workforce and their employers during this hiatus. And of course, uh, you know, 
see if we can either you know, mitigate or, or if not eliminate the virus. And then the hard bit, both at the medical side and the economic side is getting out of this mm. lockdown, in fact, into yeah. a normal uh, economic environment. Yeah, what comes on the other side. And just quickly about trust, we, some of the polling is indicating that we're beginning to see a return of some sort of trust to the system, the, the people's perceptions of institutions is better than it was 12 months ago. Uh, so uh, a couple of direct questions. Can Morrison be trusted uh, to, uh, to preside over this crisis and work out what needs to be done on the other side? Oh, sure. No, he's a, he, look, he's a very pragmatic uh, person. He's a political professional. Um, I think he's, you know, I don't think there's any issue about trust here. I mean, it's a, really a question of competence and capability. Uh, I think he's, you know, he's got the He's got all of the resources of the Australian Public Service. He's got all the resources of, the, uh, of his colleagues and the states and territories. Uh, so he's getting plenty of advice. I think the challenge is going to be, uh, the, the hardest bit, I think, is going to be managing the economic recovery uh, and what the right measures are to get out of it. But, you know, the, the good thing is, it's a bad thing, you know, at one level, but it's a good thing in another. The bad news is that the whole world is affected by this. The good news is that every other jurisdiction is going to be dealing with the same problems. So that's going to provide lots of opportunities for observing and learning from others. And uh, but, uh, sticking just with trust, just to finish this point, uh, th that sort of return of institutional trust is interesting. Where does a federal ICAC fit into that, do you think? Because that's oh, well, been... I think we definitely need a federal ICAC. Um, uh, I absolutely, uh, uh, you know, well, it was, it was one of the policy, well, one of the policies, the uh, proposals that was literally a week or two away from going into my cabinet when I was dumped as PM uh, to set up a National Integrity Commission. And I, I think I'm disappointed that that hasn't been done. Uh, I think we. I think there. I think there's a real problem that governments are not being held to account. Uh, I think, in particular, the the partisan press does not hold uh, this government to account. Um, you know, the uh, it's it's you know the News Corp News Corp does not hold the Morrison government to account. Full stop. It's a fact uh, because they've got it. They want you know that they, they like it. They like the government. They want to keep them there and they're not interested in asking any questions. Uh, so it is, um, now the rest of the media does do their best to one to some degree or other, some extent or other, but I think we absolutely need an independent integrity commission. I, I really do. And I, I'm very concerned, uh, very concerned that that has not been set up. But this is sort of the trust point. It wasn't a gratuitous slap at Scott Morrison. It's this is what I mean about trust. Do you think he sort of he gets? Do you think he gets the trust picture? Does he get the sort of mechanisms one needs as prime minister in order to renew that social license, for want of a better term? Right? If people are, are feeling more positive than they have been about institutions and about political life. Do you think the Prime Minister gets that you might just need some institutional changes in order to bed that, bed that trust back down? <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I, he, um, I, I just, I, I simply don't know. Uh, the, you know, the, you're better off, rather than speculating, you're better off judging people by their actions and the inaction on a National Integrity Commission is rather disturbing, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we go to some questions from the audience here. I'm sorry, this is obviously troubling for you, Malcolm. I'm not sure. No, what's no, going it's on okay. I've end, just but... turned my screen off. Ah, so okay. as long as I'm not being, I was having literally green and red flashing lights in front of me, so I've got mm, a problem with my screen, but no, no, no. It's, uh, that's okay, as long as it's working at your end. It is, yes, yeah, all right, let's press on. So a couple of questions from folks watching on uh, from Michael Horner who says, uh, hi, Malcolm, a lot of your critics speak about the need to excite a political base in order to be electorally successful. The idea being that if you don't have diehard supporters, you can't successfully deliver a message to the public. As a person who sought to govern from the centre, how do you believe that rational evidence-based policy can bring with it enthusiastic supporters that are fundamental to winning elections? Excellent question, Michael. 
<clears throat> well, well it's, a, it's a good question, Michael, but the, uh, a lot of that talk about exciting your base comes out of the United States. Um, and in the United States, they have voluntary voting. So you've got to excite your base to get them off the porch and get them to come and vote for you. Uh, number one. And number two, they have uh, Jerry, their congressional districts are generally gerrymandered. Um, so to protect the incumbent. Um, and so uh, to be a congressman, uh, you have to, re you know, your real contest is the primary. So if you're a Republican, you have to run off to the right. If you're a Democrat, you run off to the left. And there just isn't enough attention paid to the center, which is where, thankfully, because of, you know, objective independent districting here and, vo and compulsory voting, we, our politics is more or less determined in the, um, in the center. So, uh, you know, that you, you may excite your base here, but if that loses you the center, you'll be have a very excited base in opposition. Um, look, I think the, 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 the challenge, the, 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 the real pro the fundamental problem that occurred, has occurred in the Liberal Party is this, is that the right of the party no longer accept the premise of being in a political party. The fundamental premise of a political party is that you get a group of people in the room, you know, whether it's the broad church, the big tent, whatever you want to call it, you debate issues, uh, and then you, everyone goes along with the majority or the consensus, however you want to describe it. But if you have a minority that is so determined to get their own way that they are prepared to say, as the right did in that crazy week Catherine and I were reminiscing about a moment ago, uh, that they will blow the joint up if they don't get what they want. That is a form of terrorism. Now, obviously, no guns and bombs. I'm not suggesting anyone's been physically violent. But the bullying and intimidation uh, that you saw in that week was typical of the way the right operates. And that's both the political right inside parliament, but also their supporters in the media. You know, the ferocious bullying you see in the right-wing media nowadays. And that is designed to intimidate people. And it means that the fundamental premise of a political party is undermined. You know, John Howard's big church was defined, you know, meant that we've got people on the left side of the church and the right side of the church and people who go from one side to another and people who are lurking around in the aisles. Uh, but we resolve something together and then we get on with it. Uh, but the right doesn't work like that anymore. And, you know, that's... Well, I mean, there's a good, um, it's quite a good uh, summary about that in, um, you know, in my, uh, in my book, quoting, um, uh, quoting uh, Nola Marino, who, uh, you know, who makes, who is the chief whip. And, you know, Nola's conclusion was uh, that they, the right there, she said, um, she said her conclusion was that they didn't want me to they didn't want me to win and that a lot of people basically gave in because they wanted the insurgency to stop and that of course is the tactic of terrorism so that's the fundamental problem the party has uh, that the premise of a political party is not being accepted by a very influential part of it what about though from the, the vantage point of the community? Uh, this is uh, so out, outside the political cohort, the community, uh, you know, uh, the, that whole sort of um, more or less uh, that, that sentiment that populists have, have captured and caught, uh, you know, that we've, we're fatigued with experts, we are suspicious of technocratic solutions, uh, you know, this is the age you governed in. Um, uh, is uh, there's there's a dynamic within politics that's that's poisonous as you as you outline, but is there also an issue with the community that perhaps there is some sort of uh, well a fracture around um, you know a, well facts set of propositions uh, centrist ideas can, can you rebuild that somehow is there is it is there a way of rebuilding that <clears throat> well I hope so I think that's um... That's certainly, you know, that's my, you know, that's my politics. 
uh, um, the but you know the problem with ideological you know the problem with turning important practical issues of policy into ideological questions is that you will end up making very very bad choices. Uh, I'll give you two examples, one current and one long-standing. Uh, it was only about six weeks ago that there are people, both in, in politics and in the media and elsewhere, who were saying that the, this COVID virus was just a bad flu, you know, just no worse than the flu in some cases. We shouldn't be worried about it. And there are still political leaders in the populist right, like Bolsonaro in Brazil, who are saying exactly that. Uh, as in most places, biology uh, mugged politics with the reality of the disease. Uh, but you see the same thing on a longer term scale uh, with climate change. You know, there is a, we still have in Australia a situation where climate change is an issue of belief, of ideology, of uh, political values. Uh, whereas you know, saying you believe or disbelieve in climate change is like saying you believe or disbelieve in gravity. I mean, you may not believe in gravity, but if you jump off the top of a <laughs> tower, it, you will um, it you tends find, to assert out, that, force. You'll yes. find out that gravity believes in you. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, another now from, uh, now forgive me, Gatra, because I'm going to mispronounce your name, I'm certain. So it's Gatra Priandita, pre pre a question from Gatra. Uh, hello, PM Turnbull. My name is Gatra from Indonesia, but currently residing in Canberra. My questions are, what are your thoughts regarding the bipartisan call for a global inquiry into the origins of COVID-19? And what do you think of the medium and long-term implications of COVID on Sino-American relations? And how will that impact Australia? Well, I, I think, I, I, I think a, 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 you know, an inquiry is a very good idea. Uh, the, there's no, no question about that. Um, it will face some real challenges in China. I mean, I think the, uh, what, what I, we should hope, that, hope for is that Xi Jinping will simply will enable there to be a thoroughly objective inquiry into the origins of the uh, disease. Um, now, I know that seems counterintuitive that that would happen, but I've got to tell you, the challenges of getting, you know, um, independent scientists, getting free access to laboratories and witnesses in China, um, you know, as, uh, as uh, in the same way that weapons inspectors went into Iraq or something. I mean, honestly, that, that's going to, you know, the, the affront that will cause to the dignity of the Chinese government, uh, the party, Communist Party, is immense. So, so, it's, so that's going to that's be pretty challenging, you know. Uh, I mean, you, can you imagine the Americans allowing a, you know, an independent uh, delegation of Chinese and Russian scientists to uh, conduct an inquiry in the United States? So, you know, great powers will deal with this in a, in, in a different way. But the one thing that is absolutely clear is that while countries may have a vested interest in keeping certain things secret, you know, weapons and, you know, scientific inventions perhaps, as far as this, these pandemics and viruses are concerned, everybody has a massive vested interest in the maximum transparency. And, you know, what um, the way it should be approached, I think, with China is to say, look, and this is unfortunately you know, a lot of the rhetoric in the West um, has already become very angry and that's going to make it harder in China. I'm not suggesting the anger isn't justified, by the way. But I mean, really, uh, we've got to, we need the Chinese Communist Party to say, it, 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 mistakes undoubtedly were made, uh, errors were undoubtedly made. Uh, it's inevitable that in a bureaucracy things were covered up and accountability wasn't uh, uh, appropriately managed. But what we have to do now is let the sunlight into all of it. Because the whole world 
needs this to happen because the next virus will start somewhere else. And so everybody, we all need to have maximum transparency here. There is, you know, we're all, the one thing this virus has demonstrated is we're all on the same planet. And the virus can start in Wuhan, but it's killing people in Wisconsin. And, you know, so you, you, that's the, that is the challenge. But this is going to be a very delicate one. Now, th that feeds into the second part of the question about how it will affect American-Chinese relations. I think it'll affect it very badly uh, because uh, Americans will say this virus originated in China. Um, uh, action could have been taken to control it sooner. And that's, I think there's every reason to believe that. Um, the, uh, that, you know, there was a, a, whether it was a cover up or, you know, just turning a blind eye or, or not wanting to believe a terrible reality for whatever reason, action wasn't taken soon enough and Americans and everyone will feel that this virus could have been bottled up sooner in Wuhan. And that's why, uh, you know, the, the most, the most powerful thing she could do as a leader is say, undoubtedly mistakes have been made. We are going to be completely transparent about them because we want to learn from them and we want everybody else to learn from them so you don't make the same mistakes too. Now, whether he's a big man uh, out of a big country, whether he's big enough to be able to say that uh, remains to be seen, but that's really what you need to, that needs to happen because otherwise the resentment as the you know, as the economic damage continues, as the deaths mount up, the resentment is going to become greater and greater. What about the sort of demonstration effect, for want of a better word, of uh, uh, America mishandling the crisis? Oh yes, well that's well that I mean that I mean the Chinese. You see, this is the this is this is right. I mean the Chinese would say, their counterpoint would say, and this is the other side of the coin. The Americans would need to say, as other countries would, hey, you know, we made plenty of mistakes too. We had notice of this and didn't act soon enough. I mean, you know, there's, there's, th this is going to be a very complicated history to write. But, you know, one thing that is screamingly obvious is that from early February, the cruise ship industry should have been shut down. How on earth? were cruise ships allowed to continue operating after the 4th of February when the Diamond Princess uh, disaster occurred in, um, you know, off Tokyo. I mean, it's staggering. I mean, those cruise ships are plainly the ideal environments for contagion with the most vulnerable host population of mostly older passengers. So, uh, and if you, if you, I'm not, and this is not a criticism, this is a criticism of all governments, but but not exclusively ours, but if you look at Australia, imagine what our position would be in respect to this virus if the cruise ship industry had shut down in early February. It'd be, you know, we would, we would be a lot better off. It's perfectly obvious. Uh, so, you know, that's just one, that's just one, one example. But I think everybody, I think there needs to be a very open examination of both the origin of this virus and the way it's been treated. And it's, got to be, it's almost got to be on a sort of no blame, no shame basis, because you know, the object is not to go around blaming people. The object is actually to find out what happened, what, what went right, we'll do some more of that. What went wrong, we won't do that again. Mm. But you, you are in a unique position on this hookup in that you, you know both Trump and she, you've had dealings with both. Yeah. You've, you, your, your reflection is that both of them, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you mightily, but <laughs> both need to be a, a bit self-aware and a bit contrite about what has happened here. How do you yeah, have a chance? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I, think it's, I think it's hard for both of them. Mm. Uh, in some respects, you'd think it would be harder for Trump than she, but... You know, Trump, of course, is not totally in control of the situation in the United States any more than Morrison is here. Uh, so, you know, because it's a federal system. Um, she ultimately, in that authoritarian regime, takes responsibility for everything. Uh, so it may actually, this approach, this, you know, open the books approach may actually be harder for she than Trump. But either way, 
and, and I, I think it will be very hard to retrieve, but either way, this is what you need to do. Mm. Because, you know, I don't know if you remember, Catherine, when I launched the National Innovation and Science Agenda in 2015 with a whole lot of measures, and someone said, um, you know, how are you, are you sure these are, these are gonna work? And I said, I'm sure they won't all work. I can guarantee you they won't all work. Uh, and if things don't work, we'll dump them. If things do work, we'll do more of them. If things we think someone else is achieving the objective better or smarter or more effectively, we'll shamelessly plagiarise them. And that's what we've got to do here. We've basically got to get the facts and the experience out as quickly as possible so that we can all learn. And, you know, I think the allocating blame, which is what everyone wants to do, might actually be an obstacle to getting to the bottom of it. So that's what I'm saying. We've got to think about, should this be done on the basis of no blame, no shame? We just want to know what happened uh, and you know, assess, it, assess it accordingly so that we don't, so we do a better job the next time we get hit with a pandemic. Mm. Couple of questions. I hope we can sprint through them very quickly. Malcolm, we're on the clock, but just a couple. Yeah. Uh, from Katarina, writing a book is a, is a lonely occupation. Uh, being a prime minister and a minister is very sociable. <laughs> Which one did you enjoy more? <laughs> uh, well, I've written, I've written a few books, um, four in fact, uh, and the, it, is a, it is a lonely occupation. Stephen King said that, you know, the novelist has written more books than all of us put together probably. Uh, said that the most important ingredient for a, a writer is butt glue, by which he meant... You what know, did you say? Butt, butt glue. Butt glue. Right. By sitting, so. sitting, he obviously doesn't have a standing desk, you know, <laughs> sitting glued in your seat, pounding away on your, on your keyboard. Um, and so it is a solitary occupation, although, you know, I had a lot of help from my team uh, in my office, a lot of research. Uh, so, and, you know, a lot of help with friends and who read parts of the manuscript and commented on it you know they're acknowledged in the book of course um, the but yeah it is a, it's a grind I, I found with every book I've written and this is by far the longest that about halfway through I've been saying to myself why on earth did I start this you know this is crazy I'll never finish it um, but uh, I did and so um, um, yeah there it is so it is it's very different uh, politics is a very sociable business. That's one of the interesting things um, uh, about, um, you know, when you get out of politics, particularly when you lose a, the top office, uh, is the phone literally stops ringing. So, uh, and the, you know, the WhatsApp stop coming, <laughs> the emails stop coming. But if you've got good friends uh, and a good, you know, strong family, and you enjoy their company and your own company, uh, you can manage it fairly well, very well. Uh, now from Marion Lee, uh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Marion, forgive me if I haven't. Uh, Julie Bishop was foreign minister and also deputy PM under several leaders. How do you rate her role in your government? I don't know the answer, but uh, anyway, there we go. Excellent, excellent, uh, yes. full marks, full marks. Uh, but uh, why do you Maybe think- out of she 10. <laughs> but why do you think she was so roundly defeated in her bid for your position as Prime Minister? And did it ever occur to you to endorse Julie rather than Morrison? And if not, why not? Marion asks. Well, the first thing is I did endorse Julie. I voted for her. Um, and uh, the, there were 11 people who voted for Julie, two of whom were me and Julie. Uh, the Look, uh, basically... There was a real concern from the people, mostly moderates, who were determined that Dutton not become prime minister. There was a real concern that if the ballot ended up between, if there was a ballot between Dutton, Julie and Scott, and if the moderates all piled in to support Julie, that, uh, and she finished ahead of Scott, and so it was Julie v Dutton that Dutton would win. Uh, we'll never know whether that's right or not, but I think there's, there's some force to that argument. Uh, there, are, there were quite a few people in that party room that would not vote for Julie, uh, not least because she was a woman. And uh, so that was, um, 
you know, that was that was that was the reason why uh, most of the moderates voted for uh, Morrison rather than Julie in that first ballot. Uh, the, now, where are we? Yes, Helen Sullivan uh, from ANU. Helen Sullivan uh, says that Barack Obama said in 2019 that if women ran every country in the world, uh, picking up from Julie, <laughs> if women ran every country in the world, there would be an improvement in living standards and outcomes. Do you think that men should give, away, give way to women in order to lead us out of this, grob, of this global crisis? That's Helen Sullivan. Um, well, I, I certainly, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting argument. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it's right or not. Um, I don't know that, I, I, think we, I think we need more, we, we certainly need more women in government and in parliament. And when you look at the hash, the men have made in so many places, the women could only improve it. Uh, but, you know, one of our big problems in Australia is, and particularly in the Liberal Party, is we don't, simply don't have enough women in the room to begin with, in the parliament to begin with, let alone in the cabinet. And last one uh, from uh, JP. Um, JP asks, and this may, be, uh, this may be a vain hope, given how busy you've been writing, what books have you been reading recently? Uh, well, I've I've read um, I've read William Dalrymple's The Anarchy, that great history of the East India Company, you know that that makes the most rapacious um, hedge fund of today look like a <laughs> an amateur, like a wimp, an yep. amateur. Mm -hmm. um, the um, and uh, what else have I? What else have I been reading? Oh, just dipping in, you know, dipping back into uh, ancient history, actually. Oddly enough, I've been rereading re -reading one of my favourite books, which is Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. I was going to say, Thucydides, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, it's the best history, you know. It's, I mean, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War is the first history in the, you know, in the Western tradition. Um, you know, the, uh, there, there are people like Herodotus that, you know, uh, wrote, you know, f lists of fables and, you know, tall tales from far afield. But Thucydides is, sets out his historiog historiographic uh, method at the outset. And, and it's, uh, you know, it is, a, it is just, it's an extraordinary piece of work and, you know, two and a half thousand years old. Mm -hmm. Well, I think sadly, uh, that is, that's all we have time for this evening. I want to thank you, Malcolm, and it's clearly been problematic for you on and off technically. So thank you for persevering. And yeah, no, it's, it's okay. You know, my screen was doing weird things. And then when I turned the screen off, that everything worked just that I couldn't see your happy beaming face. <laughs> but um, at least the whole thing didn't crash. So that's good. No, 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 exactly. And thank you to the ANU. Uh, for uh, for experimenting uh, with this mode of conversation and for which has allowed us to include a whole lot of people at a time when we've all got to be socially distant. So thank you very much to that and to all the hardworking folks at ANU who worked uh, assiduously over the last couple of days to put this together. And I think I'll throw back to Brian for some final thoughts or words. Great, and thank you very much, Catherine and Malcolm. I'd like to first thank the audience for the involvement and questions for what is certainly a unique event uh, for ANU and perhaps we'll uh, use the technology uh, in ways in the future to enhance uh, some of our events uh, in the post-COVID-19 world. Malcolm, I personally have found you one of the most unusual political figures I've come across uh, in my times here in Australia. Uh, you've always been an intellectual with a sharp edge and forthrightness that to me seems to keep most people from getting elected these days. Uh, and it's uh, compared to what I would describe as the more typical blunt instruments that obfuscate everything that they say. And so I really appreciate it again tonight, your sharp edge forthrightness. Uh, I think you have provided all of us insights into the Australian political system and indeed our Australian democracy. And I will be continuing to think about these in uh, the days and months ahead. Australia needs to have continued conversations on our democracy, our place in the world, and how we're gonna thrive in the future in the very challenging times that certainly lie ahead. 
These are, of course, topics at the heart of a &E's mission, and I hope we can involve you in these conversations the months and years uh, that we need to have. Catherine, thank you for leading our excellent conversation tonight. We appreciate your willingness to lead this, our first for the ANU, a virtual Meet the Author series. So Malcolm, Catherine, our audience, stay safe. Thank you all. And I personally look forward to reading your book, Malcolm. It looks to be a truly riveting read. And to one and all, good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>